Welcome back to SuperCloud 22, our inaugural event. It's a pilot event here in the Cube studios. We're live and streaming virtually until we do it in person, maybe next year. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube with Dave Vellante. We've got two great guests, distinguished uh, engineers, managers, CTOs, investors. Mariana Tessel is the CTO of Intuit. Insuk Ray, founder of Vertex Ventures. Both have a lot of DNA. Founder of LoudCloud here with Mark Andreessen, Ben Horowitz, a variety of other great ventures you've done, and now you're an investor. Yep. Mariana, you've been a seasoned CTO, VP of Engineering, VMware, Docker, Intuit now. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. So, super cloud is a, is a thing. And apparently, it's got a lot of momentum. And you guys got SaaS over there at, at uh, Intuit. And so you're investing. And we were challenged on super cloud. Our initial thesis was you build on the clouds, get all that leverage, like Snowflake, you get a good differentiation, and then you compete and then move to other clouds. Now it's becoming a thing where I can do this, every enterprise could possibly do it. So I want to get your guys' thoughts on what you think of super cloud concept uh, and where are the holes in it, what needs to be defined. And so we'll start with you. You've done a lot of cloud th things in your day. What do you yeah, think? I mean, it's the whole cloud journey started with a desire to consolidate and desire to actually provide uniformity and, and standards driven ways of doing things. And I think Amazon was a leader there. They helped kind of teach everybody else. You know, when I was doing Lao Cloud, we were trying to do it with proprietary stacks, just wouldn't work. But once everyone standardized upon Unix and you know, the chipsets no longer became as relevant, they did a lot of good things there. Um, but what's happened since then is now you've got competing standards at the API layer, at the interface layer, no longer at the chipset layer, no longer at the operating system layer, right? So the evolution of the, the, the battles are still there. Um, when you talk about multi-cloud and super cloud though, like one of the big things you have to keep in mind is um, latency is not free. Latency is very expensive, and it's getting even more expensive now with, with multi-cloud. So you have to really understand where the separations of boundaries are between your data, your compute, and, and the network is just there as a facilitator to help binding compute and data, right? And I think there's a lot of bets being made across different vendors like Cloudflare, Akamai, as well as Amazon, Google, Microsoft, in terms of how they think we should take computing either to the edge from the core or back and forth. Um, Lisa, this is structural change. I mean, this is structural. It's desired by incumbents, but it's not something that I'm seeing from the consumption. I'd love to hear, hear from Iran's perspective from a consumption point of view, like how much edge computing really matters, right? Marianne? Um, so I think there's like, there's kind of um, a, a story of like two, like it's kind of, you can cut it from both edges. No, no pun intended. On uh, one end, um, it is really simplifying to actually go into like a single cloud and standardize on it and just have everything there. But I think what over time companies find is that they end up in multiple clouds, whether like, uh, you know, through acquisitions or through like needing to use a service in another cloud. So you do find yourself in a situation where you have multi-cloud um, multi and you have to kind of work through it and understand how to make it all like work. And latency is an issue, but also for many, many workloads, you can work around it uh, and you can make it work where you have workloads that actually span multiple vendors and clouds. You know, again, having said that, I would say the world is such that it's still a simplifying assumption when if you go to a single cloud, it's much easier to just go and, and bet on that. Easier in terms of everything's integrated. IaaS works with SaaS. They solve a lot of problems. Correct, and you can do like for your developers, you can actually provide an environment that's super um, homogenous, simple. You can use services easily up and down the stack. And you know, we we actually made that deliberate decision when we started migrating to the cloud. At the beginning, it was like, oh, let's do like hybrid. We'll you know, make it so it work anywhere. And it was so complicated. It was not worth it. When was the, when did you give up? What was the moment? Was there a flashpoint where you said, oh, this is terrible, this is dead? Yeah, when, when we started to try to make it interoperable and you just see what it requires to do that and the complexity of the architecture, that it just became not worth it uh, for the gains you have. So speaking obviously as a SaaS provider, right? So it just doesn't, it didn't make business case sense for you guys to do that. So it was super cloud then, 
an infrastructure thing. We just heard from Benoit Dajaville that they're not, they're going beyond instantiating their, their data cloud. They're actually running, you know, their own little snow grid, they called it. Um, and, and then when I asked him, well, what about latency? He said, well, we copy data over, you know? So, okay, but that's what you have to do. But that's a singular experience with the same governance, with the same security. Just wasn't worth it for you guys is what I'm hearing. Correct, but again, like for some workloads or for some services that we want to use, we are going to go there and we are going to then figure out what is the work around the latency issue, um, whether it's like copy or, you know, redundancy. You know, well, the like question that. I have, Dave, is on Snowflake is, maybe my <laughs> question for you in, in the tech panel, is Snowflake a TAM expansion opportunity or is there a technical reason to go to other clouds? I think they wanted to leverage the hyperscale infrastructure globally and they said that they're out there, it's a free gift, we're going to go take it. I think it started with, we're on AWS, Do you think and then we're on Azure, and then we're on Google, and then they said, why don't we just connect all these and make it a singular experience? And yeah, I guess it's a TAM expansion as a differentiator, and it's, it adds value, right? If I can share data across that global network. Well, they have customers on Azure now, right? Yeah, of course. You yeah, guys well, don't need to go. GCP. What do you think about that? Well, I think Snowflake's in a good position because they work mostly with analytical workloads and you have capacity that's always going to increase. Like no one subtracts your analytical workload, like ever. Right. So there's just compounded growth is like 50% or 80% for you know, many enterprises, despite their best intentions not to collect more data, they just can't stop doing it. So it's different than if you're like an Oracle or a transactional data database where you don't have those you know, kind of infinite growth paths. So Snowflake's going to continue to expand footprint and their customers, they don't mind as long as they can figure out the, the lowest cost denominator for, for that. Yeah, so it um, makes sense to be on all but, the clouds for them. But, for, for them, for sure. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but Oracle just announced with Microsoft what I would call a super cloud, a, 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 a cross-cloud database service running on OCI and Azure with very low latency and a database that looks like a, a, a singular experience. Yeah. With a, with a PaaS layer that- lost me after OCI. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, but that's, the, that's the, the BS answer for all you VCs that, oh, nobody, Develops on Oracle, well, it's a $240 billion market cap company. Show me who and you all want to be Oracle. Oracle. Oh, we're going to talk about SRDF and EMC or, next. You all want Oracle, <laughs> so there we go. You throw that into, you all want Oracle to buy your companies, your funding, you know, because we all want to be like Oracle with that layoffs? kind of cash flow. But, but, but anyway. Here's, but, here's one thing that I'm noticing that is going to be really practical, I think, for companies that do run SaaS, is because, like, you know, you have all these solutions, whether it's, like, analytics or like monitoring or logging or whatever, and each one of them is very data hungry. And all of them have like SaaS solutions that end up copying the data, moving data to their cloud, and then they might charge you by the size of your data. Um, it does become kind of overwhelming for companies to use that many tools and basically maybe have that data um, kind of charged for in multiple places because you use it for different purposes or just in general, if you have a lot of data, um, you know, that, that is becoming an issue. So that's something that I've noticed uh, in, our, in our own kind of, you know, a world, but it's just something that I think companies need to think about how they solve, because eventually a lot of companies will say, I cannot have all these solutions, or there's no way mm -hmm. I'm going to be willing to have so many copies of the data and actually pay for that so many times. Just something to think about. But one of the criticisms of the super cloud concept is that it's just SaaS. If I'm running workload on-prem and, and I've got a uh, you know, connection to the cloud, which you probably do, that's, that's SaaS, what's, what's the big deal? And that's not anything new or, or different. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that, but Goldman Sachs, for instance, just announced the service last reInvent with AWS connecting their tools, their data, and their software from on-prem to AWS. They're offering it as a service. I'm like, hmm, kind of looking like super cloud, but maybe it's just SaaS. It could be, and like what I'm talking about is not so much like, you know, like whether you want to connect your data, but the idea is like a lot of the providers of different services, like in the PaaS and, and like higher layer, they actually copy the data or they need the data in their cloud or their solution. And it just becomes um, complicated and expensive is, is kind of like my point. So yes, connecting it, like for you to be, have the data in one place, then be able to connect to it. I think that is a valid 
if, if that's kind of what you think about as a super cloud, that is a, a valid need I think that companies it, will have. Where developers actually want access to tools that might exist. Well, so the key cloud. is developers, right? Yeah, developers totally. decide all decisions, not database on administrators, not you know, 100%. security engineers, yeah. not sysadmins. So what's really interesting is where are the developers going next? If you look at the current winners in the current ecosystem, companies like MongoDB, I mean, they capture the minds of yep. the JavaScript, you know, Node.js developers Absolutely. very early on. And I started Couchbase and I could tell you like, the difference was that capture motion was so important. So developers are basically used to this game-like experience now where they want to see tools that are free. Whether it's open source or not, they actually don't care. They just and want, they want it SaaS. They want it SaaS, delivered on demand, right? And pay as you go. And so there's a lot of these different frameworks coming out, next generation, no code, low code, whether it's Java, JavaScript, Rust, you know, whatever, you know, Golang. And there's a lot of people fighting religious wars about how to develop the next kind of modern pattern, design pattern. Okay. And that's where a lot of ex excitement is, uh, how we look at like investment opportunities. Like, where are those who are, big bets? Who are fe you know, frustrated developers? Why are they frustrated? What's wrong with their current environment? You know, do they really enjoy using Kubernetes or trying to use Kubernetes? Yeah. Right, like, developers have a very different view than operators. Well, you mentioned Couchbase. I mean, I look at Couchbase, what they're doing with Capellas as a form of super cloud. I mean, yeah. I think that's an excellent, and they're bringing that out yeah. to the edge. We're going to hear later on from someone from Couchbase that, that is going to talk about that. Now, yeah. it's kind of a lightweight, you know, sort of, yeah. it's going to be a, a synchronization, yeah. well, but it's the, the beginning. The of, cool new venture deal that I'm not in, but it was like DuckDB. <laughs> I'm like, what's DuckDB? Like, well, it's an in-memory database that has like this like remote store thing. I'm like. Okay, that sounds interesting. Like, let's call Mike Olson because that sounds like Sleepy Cat redone for a distributed world. But like, it's it's like there's a lot of people refactoring design patterns that we're all grew up with since yeah. the pub sub days of you know typical sure. rendezvous, right? Yeah, sure. that's the refactoring. I think that's yeah. the big pattern. So I have to ask you guys, what are you guys investing in? We've got a couple minutes left to chat about that. What are you investing at into it from a from a, a CTO engineering perspective? And what are you investing in that feels super cloud like to you? Cool. Well, the, the thing that like, I'm focused on is to make sure that we have absolutely best in the world uh, development environment for our engineers, where it's uh, modern, it's easy to use, and it incorporates as many things as uh, we can into that environment so the engineers don't have to think about it. Like one big uh, example would be security and how we incorporated that into the development environment. So again, the engineers don't have to uh, bother with trying to think through um, how they secure their workloads in every step of the way. Um, there are other things that we incorporated, whether it's like rollbacks or monitoring or, um, you know, like a bazillion of other things. But I think that's uh, a really an investment that has panned off for us. Uh, we actually started investing in development environments several years ago. We started measure our development velocity and we, it actually went up by 6x nice. just by investing uh, in so things like that. So user experience, developer experience and productivity, pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. Yeah, that's like a big investment area for us, the, you know, cloud. cloud sounds related. like a super cloud like in refactor. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that you're on AWS. We are mostly on AWS, yes. And so what are you investing in that, that from a VC money doling out standpoint that feels super cloud like? Um, so very similar to what we just touched on, a lot of developer tool experiences. Uh, we have a company that we've invested in uh, called Ops Level that does service catalogs. Um, it's, it's helping yeah. you know, understand your, where your services live and how they could be accessed and, and you know, enterprise kind of abilities that come with that. And then we have a company called Lumigo that helps you do serverless debugging and container debugging because it turns out debugging distributed you know, applications is a real problem right now. Just you can only do so much by log tracing, right? Uh, we have a company, uh, haven't announced yet, that's in the WebAssembly space. So we're looking at modernizing the, the next generation PaaS stack and throwing everything out the window, including Java and all of the you know, current pre-built components, because it turns out 90% of enterprise workloads are actually not used. They're, they're just piles of code you've compiled with, they're sitting there as vulnerabilities that no one's actually accessing, but you still have to compile with all of it. So we have a lot of bloatware happening in the enterprise. So we're thinking about how do you skinny that up uh, with the next generation PaaS that's enterprise capable with security yeah. context and frameworks. Super PaaS. Well, yeah, super yeah. PaaS. That's a kind of good way to <laughs> well, put is it. Well, <laughs> is it a consistent developer experience across clouds? It, it is, and, 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 and WebAssembly is a very raw standard, if you can call it that. I mean, it's, but it's supported by every modern browser, every yeah. major platform vendor, Cloudflare and Adobe and others, and are using it for their uses. And 
it's not just about your edge browser compute. It's really, you can take the same framework and compile it down to server side as well as client side. Just like JavaScript was a client side tool before it became Node, right? Right. So we're looking at that as a very interesting opportunity. It's yeah. very nascent. Yeah. Um, Great yeah. patterns. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for spending time out of your busy day, Ariana, and thanks for your commentary and appreciate your coming on theCUBE's first inaugural SuperCloud event pilot. <laughs> thanks for, for sharing. Thanks for, for sharing. having us. Thanks for having us. us. Yeah. Okay, you. more coverage here, SuperCloud 2022. I'm Trevor Dave Vellante. Stay with us, we've got our Cloudarati panel coming up next. <laughs>